I'm so excited to talk about this topic, and we're going to be discussing the mistakes I made as a first-time founder, and John, he's going to be discussing some of the mistakes he made as a first-time founder. So, John, I'm so excited to talk about this. I know you laughed when I texted you that this was the topic of the day. Yeah, you know, it's perfect because um, no matter how much we prepare the first time around on something as important as this, it's it's hard to put it together and make yeah. it work. Yeah. I agree. I 100% agree on that. And, you know, I remember when I first bought a business and it was in the wireless industry. And the biggest mistake that I made was not doing due diligence. That was the biggest mistake. And um, it ended up being not only my biggest mistake, but it also was my, one of my biz biggest successes. And, you know, had I not, you know, tr I mean, obviously I trusted this individual and, uh, you know, he uh, took advantage of me, but had I not gone through that experience, I wouldn't have been, been able to probably gone as far as I did in the wireless industry, because I literally had to learn everything from the ground up. And, um, it was, uh, it was a it was a challenge, and I cried probably for uh, eight months, every single day. And um, it uh, I was just I was in the shower thinking about this topic because I think as a first time founder, we we all experience that, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely true. Yeah, you know, uh, after I had laughed and contacted you, and was uh, really pleased to see you select this one. I started thinking back to my earlier days as a supervisor, and I started doing supervision and management of people back in 1962. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've been doing this for a very long time. And uh, boy, the lessons, oh my God, you know, it, there's no way that I could have forecast some of the things I would learn. Absolutely. Yeah. And so what, tell me one of your biggest lessons, you know, when you first, you know, were a founder and you first started your company. Tell me, tell me what happened. Well, we, uh, Judy and I uh, started out uh, with a company that was uh, geared towards teaching people how to be leaders and managers. Oh, okay. So it was kind of like a consulting firm? Yeah, it was okay. our first consulting firm. And then I had a client right off the bat. I was uh, hired by Penn Learning Systems to put on programs for 36 colleges and universities throughout the United States. And so I had to put together some really high horsepower things and then go deliver them. And mm -hmm. I was out on the road uh, putting these programs on two to three days every week. And I'll tell you, flying coast to coast in the United States and up and down and sideways, and it was wired, it was really tiring. Mm -hmm. I did that successfully for about three and a half years. And then finally, uh, Judy had enough of it. She said, either get off the road or uh, find yourself a new wife. And uh, <laughs> It took and, its uh, toll. Yeah, you know, it, it was it was pretty bluntly delivered and I got off the road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, and so what did, what did you find? Uh, during that process, you know, some of the mistakes that you made, because uh, I remember one of the things that come to mind is, is that, you know, at the time I didn't fully understand the market. Mm -hmm. That's a critical um, understanding. I think that founders need to understand their market. You know, and, and that's a really good one, because I think to some degree, I had made some bold assumptions about things and uh, particularly about the markets that I would be serving, especially in different parts of the United States that I had not traveled to before. And uh, I was somewhat surprised when I would get to these areas and people were performing and doing things differently than I had anticipated. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was dealing with cultural differences uh, language differences, a whole series of things. And nobody had ever told me that I should anticipate this. And so it was 
a, a rush to uh, learn as quickly as I could and then began to implement these things in a way that uh, would enable me to continue to operate. Now, Judy and I worked well as a team. We were really quite uh, compatible. Uh, Judy was very good at the details of uh, the operations. I was more into the leadership and management of the people. Uh, she didn't want to do that at all, so uh, that was my task. And uh, we were able to split up our duties in such a manner that uh, it was easier for each, each of us and then together as a team to operate. Uh, however, I'll, I'll have to tell you that my first uh, understanding of what not to do uh, came as a result of putting on programs for uh, people who really didn't want to do it. They were being forced to attend these programs. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Uh, that was such a strain. Uh, they were sitting there totally bored out of their mind doing this because their bosses said, you must. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you're sitting there in front of a group of about 40 people, half of them are half asleep, don't really want to be there, uh, are challenging you to show me why I should care. Yeah. Oh, that was a that was a real wake up call, and so I I started to learn how better to do this. Mm -hmm. Even so, it, it, and back in the those days, you know, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't, uh, in fact, telephone usage was very very expensive, mm -hmm. especially in very long distance distance uh, communication. Uh, didn't have the fax machines we have today or any other major communication device. And so much of what we did uh, and what we were able to accomplish well was done face to face. Yeah. Get on an airplane, go see somebody, talk to them face to face, deal things that way. And, you know, it was only years later that we started to have the tools that we have today and be able to take advantage of them. And so like it or not, getting to learn how to deal with people face to face from different points of view, totally different. If sometimes, like I said, they didn't want to be there, but we had to make it happen. Yeah. You know, you mentioned teams. You know, that is one of the most important aspects to building a very successful company is, is that you have to be able to build teams in a way that can execute on the company's goals and mission. And I think that a lot of times founders, if they've never done that before, that can be very challenging for individuals to do. Absolutely true. In fact, uh, it's challenging for the founder for, for different reasons. One of them is oftentimes when you ask people to put together a mission statement or uh, something of that order where they're going to talk about what they're going to do in the long term, uh, they don't know how to do it. Everything is short term to them. Did you discover discover that along the way too? Yeah, I mean, you you know, as a leader, I think that you really have to make sure um, you have to learn how to delegate in order to elevate. I would always, you know, say because oh, I like that term. That's a good one. Yeah, because it's always important. Um, and then you need to have number one accountability. You know, when you give a project to you know, an individual or an employee, you have to make sure that whatever task you give them, that they actually complete it. You know, you can't just allocate something and then not make sure that it didn't get done or whatever the case is. And I think that that is one of the things that I see that founders definitely make, you know, and, and this is such a critical point, um, especially when you're trying to scale an organization, you know, you're only as good um, you know, how they always say you're only as good as your, you know, your weakest link, but it is so true, especially when you have a very small startup um, team. Yeah, true. Uh, but, you know, as you go to a larger team, uh, there are some other issues that pop up even worse. Oh, uh, you know, their span of delegation is a, is a real touchy one. You uh -huh. know, for the most part, uh, you never want to supervise more than nine people on a flat uh, plane of, uh, of, of relationships. Mm -hmm. It's too hard to communicate and keep things flowing 
uh, adequately. Yeah, I agree on that one. You know, I, I remember uh, several years ago, I uh, had the fortunate opportunity to um, be invited with Tim Draper. And he was talking about how he keeps his uh, VC teams really, really small. He, th he, he would say like under seven people so they could really maneuver and scale, especially, you know, I don't know if you remember when um, that whole crisis happened with uh, SPV Bank. And oh, people, yes. Yeah, and people were <laughs> trying to move their money out. And he was saying because their team was small and they didn't outsource, you know, the, the um, operations of that, that they were able to move the money around. So it is important to make sure that you keep your teams small enough to your point, because I mean, as you grow, different, you know, parts of the organization is going to develop in such a way that you have to make sure that the communication is there because it can really fall flat. And that kind of brings me to my next topic and, you know, scaling too soon or too fast. I think a lot of times founders, you know, I remember when I was in wireless, we were opening up so many stores it made my head spin. And it's, it's, I use the analogy, it's like going down the freeway at 300 miles an hour, you're not able to see or even respond, you know, to some of the things that are going to catch up to you. And you have to make sure that when you are scaling, that you do it in such a way where you don't crash and burn. Yeah, I, I that's one of the lessons that was really a major one for me. <laughs> yeah. uh, back in 19, what happened? Yeah, in 1971, I was asked to be part of a startup team. And we were going to put together a nationwide organization to uh, uh, sell a variety of uh, communication devices and tools. Um, there were six of us sitting around a table looking at each other saying, okay, what do we do first? Two and a half years later, there was 1,400 of us all together. And uh, it, it grew too fast. It was out of control. And uh, the result was we started to flounder. We were then purchased by another organization, much larger, uh, coming from the Defense Department area. And they then stripped us clean of all of our technology, all of our information, et cetera, everything, and put everybody on the street. Wow. And that was one of those things that, you know, I'm glad I went through it. I would never, ever do it again, though. My God, what a, <laughs> what a terrible experience it was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what I say. If you're scaling too soon and or too fast, it could be very, very dangerous. So not all growth is good. <laughs> no, you know, it, it, and that's one of those things that you can never tell somebody what they ought to do. And no matter if we've been told and shown what was going to happen to us, we probably would never have believed it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I know. I, I remember when I was working with uh, um, one of my advisors, a long-term advisor uh, named Neil, and he warned me of the growth speed that it could definitely, it rocked the boat. But, you know, I'm telling you, it, sh it shakes you to your core. When yeah. you're when you're growing that fast, but you it's like all hands on deck 24 hours a day. Well, yeah. And uh, yeah, you cannot rest. Um, and uh, this was in a period of uh, really high acceptance of high technology and people starting to really go beyond whether they should have been. And uh, the information did not flow fast enough for them to keep up. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly us as providers, we couldn't respond fast enough. Yeah. And when we went, started to uh, go up against a uh, major aerospace company as our supervisor and boss, uh, boy, things really, really got tight fast. Yeah, absolutely. Well, today I've been joined by my good friend, John Tabor, and we've been discussing the mistakes that we have made as founders. I hope you found this content useful. If you have, please like and subscribe and share with your friends. My name is Rose Vitali. I'm the founder of the Female Founders Institute, where we help women grow and scale their organization. John, it's always a pleasure. Until next time, cheers. Thank you, Rose. It's been fun. See you later. Cheers.